Um, it's actually been several years since I gave a department seminar, so um, I've got a lot to update you on, so I'll try not to take too long <laughs> over that, but um, it's really nice to share some of the work that we've been doing in the Magma Lab over the past couple of years. So I've called this talk um, Unexpected Journeys in the Field and in the Lab. And that's probably because um, what I've learned over the past few years is you can have a plan, but then sometimes things don't work out. And it's good to take advantage of new opportunities as they come along and engage new findings and things like that. So um, the, uh, the picture in the background there is um, of an eruption that happened in Iceland in 2021. And um, uh, I'm someone who studies magma and how it moves beneath um, the surface to feed volcanic eruptions. So at the bottom of, um, of this uh, image, there's tiny little black specks here. These are people right next to the lava flow. Um, and so whilst they're all oohing and ahhing, looking at um, the lava and the eruption, me and my group were standing pondering what's going on beneath the surface so hopefully in the talk today I can give you a little bit of some insight about what we think might be going on underneath volcanoes um, before they erupt. Um, so uh, the talk has got me on the front page but actually it's a team effort so these are all the people currently working in the magma lab at the moment and they're all working on really interesting projects um, to do with how magmas or fluids move through cracks so please go and talk to them about their work I will be showing some of the, their findings today and um, yeah I'm sure they'll be very interested to talk to you about it even more and um, you can also follow us on Twitter if you like. Um, so our approach um, in the Magma Lab is a multidisciplinary approach using a combination of um, earth sciences, um, engineering, um, physics, mathematics, and also social sciences. And what we're doing is that we're trying to use this multidisciplinary approach to understand what's going on um, beneath volcanoes and um, try to help recognize the signals of when a volcano might erupt and um, where and when that might happen. So we um, do a combination of laboratory models, analog models, um, and um, field observations. Um, and we also combine all this information into numerical uh, simulations. And what we're trying to do is sort of uh, tackle some of these questions about what emplacement models are, about how magma moves, and, and how the magma and the host rock coupling sort of controls a lot of the interesting dynamics. Um, so my first unexpected journey in the field came in August 2021, um, when we had the interesting, um, exciting opportunity to actually witness a volcanic eruption. Um, so this wasn't part of the plan at all. Um, so we were supposed to go into the field in summer 2020 to go and study ancient um, dikes, magma filled fractures in the crust and how they uh, had gotten there. Um, but in the intermediate period between then and here, there was an eruption that started. So it was a really nice opportunity to actually go and witness an eruption. And I feel like this was quite informative um, for us um, because people who um, generally are studying magma and how it's flowed in the past, so for the solid record, um, and uh, people who do uh, lab work and things, we don't often get the opportunity to go and um, visit an eruption actually happening. Um, and then also eruptions are often very, very dangerous, so you often can't get as close as this. So this was really a, a unique and unexpected um, opportunity for us. And you could really get very close to the action. So this is Caitlin and Tegan um, sitting looking at uh, lava flows. Um, and it was very interesting to see how the vent um, was bubbling and, um, and how that fed this really substantial lava flow. So I've got a couple of videos just to show you some of the activity that we saw we were there. Um, and so I think you can hopefully see, oh, it's a bit stuck, uh, sticky, um, but the, the the vent is really going for it. We've then got um, this really substantial uh, lava flow uh, that it developed. And um, and it's really an interesting opportunity to, to actually see things flowing and see how dynamic uh, magma movement, this is lava at the surface, but what we're doing a lot in our group is trying to link some of these observations of how things are flowing at the surface to understand what's going on in the subsurface. And this was a, a very 
very cool um, thing um, to witness as well, which was um, basically a lava or lava fall, and we see um, magma fragmentation actually happening down the slope um, right in front of our eyes. And the people are really probably a bit too close to be honest um, here. We were a bit scared, weren't we, Caitlin? <laughs> we kept very far back um, from these things. Um, and but you know that's an example of an eruption which has uh, was very well anticipated. Um, it's an eruption that's relatively safe, let's say, in that it was away from um, the population, and um, its behaviour was relatively predictable. So you could actually get pretty close to it um, and to study it scientifically, but also for uh, touristic purposes as well. But a strong motivation for all volcanologists really comes from when things are not like that. And volcanic eruptions can have devastating impact on, um, on people, on uh, economies, um, through um, fatalities, uh, through damaged infrastructure, um, but also the volcanism really can tear communities apart. Um, and that is something that we're very, we feel very deeply as volcanologists that we want to try and help uh, understand what's going on in these systems. And um, it's been estimated there's over 800 million people at risk from volcanic eruptions. So um, but this is a, actually quite a strong motivator for our work. Um, so um, I've shown you lava um, at the surface and bubbling vents, but actually I want to try and convince you in this talk that all of the really exciting stuff is actually going on in the subsurface. And it's um, through magma field fractures, which are called dikes and sills, and they cut through um, the, um, the crust all the way to the surface to feed eruptions in this kind of interconnected network. And the map dikes and sills, these are the primary structures through which magma is transported from great depths to the surface, and also how magma is stored in the, in the subsurface. If it can be stored, then it can evolve, its properties change, and it's through that process that we tend to get the more explosive and more dangerous eruptions. So understanding how magma moves and why it stops is actually a really important part of understanding what's going on in volcanic systems. And also, um, volcanic plumbing systems are often associated with mineralization systems as well. So there's an economic uh, geology incentive and motivation behind this kind of work as well. Um, but linking back to the hazard side of things, um, basically rapid um, and reliable decision making is needed um, in the lead up and during volcanic crises. But the problem is that our understanding of the subsurface isn't sufficient to allow that at the moment. And so that's because we've got quite a lot of problems. And I just want to acknowledge um, Soraya Hilmi Hazim, my previous PhD student. She's now a doctor working in the University of Malaysia. She's a very talented artist as well. And she's able to bring together these things into some really nice illustrations, basically showing the complexity of um, the volcanic plumbing system all the way through the crust down to the mantle and how um, all these different methods that we can use um, to try and understand uh, what's going on during magma ascent. Um, and and that's because the, the signals which come from the volcanic plumbing system, they are going to be where we can get information about where, when and how an eruption is going to occur. Um, but we have these problems um, and we need to try and solve them using all these different kind of techniques. So um, there are kind of two approaches that can be used. One is to study magma and how it's moving now. So I showed you an eruption. There was magma moving around in the subsurface there, feeding that eruption. Um, and the way that that's kind of understood is through these indirect observations, um, through um, geophysical signals, um, so earthquakes or geodesy, so how the ground uh, movement um, is, is changing, also from gas emissions, things like that. So that's all information which is telling you about how magma is actually moving around now. Um, but as a geologist, I'm interested in how magma has moved in the past and what can be recorded um, there to help us understand how magma moves now. But again, we have a problem in that we're limited on the exposures that we can get to the volcanic plumbing system. 
But when we can get those exposures um, in the field, then we'll do things like um, igneous petrology or geochemistry to try and unravel some of the interesting architecture of the plumbing system and what happened uh, during the eruption. So a multi-method uh, problem needing a multi-method approach to solve it. So I'm going to, I've talked to you a little bit about the field already. Um, now I'm going to talk to you about some of the analog experiments um, that we do in the lab up on the fourth floor in the um, Medusa lab, which I'll introduce in just a minute. And also now in the volcanology lab in the basement too. So what we're doing in these um, scaled analog experiments is that we are basically creating a scaled down model of the Earth's crust and of the magma that moves around um, within it to feed volcanic eruptions. And we um, use an approach, um, dimensional analysis um, and Buckingham Pi theorem to look at the scaling of the geometry. So the kind of shapes and the sizes of the bodies and um, the kinematics, so how fast things are moving and the dynamics. So that's to do with things like pressures. And through that scaling analysis, you could basically um, study processes which are so large or maybe even so small in nature, you can scale them up so that they are workable in the analog lab. And it turns out if you do this analysis, jelly is a very good analog material to represent the Earth's crust. So we have a lot of jelly in the basement. So if you want to make a trifle at any point, you know where to come. Um, and what we generally do in our experiments is that we create a, a tank of this elastic, transparent, um, solid material, and then we inject into it our magma analog. So the crust material, the jelly, is representing rock, which has a Young's uh, modulus of about 1 to 10 pascals. It's also photoelastic, which means that we can actually see stress inside the experiment. And it's a really versatile setup, so we can um, make it more complex if we want to. We can add layers in, we can add fractures, um, all different kinds of crustal heterogeneities. We can introduce those. We can also um, stress it, so we can squash it or we can pull it apart and um, then do our experiments in, in, in other stress fields too. So it's very versatile. Um, and for our magma analog material, um, there's again the scaling analysis which is done on which material is best to use to represent magma. And in the uh, first experiments I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you just uh, water being injected into the gelatin. And so this is just a sketch um, setup of our, our tank in side view and in plan view. And this is um, uh, going to be some work done by um, Dr. Soraya Hilmi Hazim during her PhD here a few years ago. Um, so we've got a, a clear um, perspex tank, which is 30 centimetres high, 40 centimetres square. And around that tank, we put um, these polarising sheets. So there's one there in, in the front and the back. And then um, we put uh, in these experiments, we scatter some um, fine grained particles on the top. And um, so with the polarizing sheets, we can see the stress field inside the jelly. And with the um, sand on the top, we can shine a, a laser through the um, on top of the tank. And then from that, we can actually um, detect any motion at the surface. So this is what Sarai did in her PhD. And in these experiments I'm going to show you, it's initially hydrostatic, so there's no um, starting stress field in there at all. And um, the fluid, the magma, the water, is injected into the base um, at constant flux. So these are um, three videos of the experiments. Let's see how well these play. Okay, this, this is pretty good. So it's the same experiment um, viewed from three different angles. Um, so in the bottom uh, left, you can see the polarized light view and you can see the colored um, bands here. These relate to um, stress intensity around the um, magma field, about the water filled crack as it grows. This is then the opposite um, view um, of the um, tank. And you can see that this dike that we've made, this experimental dike is very thin in, in one direction and penny shaped in the other. And that is something which is actually anticipated based on um, theoretical models, but we can, we are then uh, creating this in our dynamic um, laboratory experiments. And then you probably saw that uh, in this top video, the tiny little slit that's appeared at the surface and then this lava flow. 
um, has formed. So this is a small fissure formed as the, the dike then erupts. And the size of the fissure at the surface is much smaller than the size of the dike that, that's actually fed it. And so from those experiments and by looking at the laser transect, we can see how the ground level changed um, as the dike approached the surface. And this is what this graph is here at different time intervals before eruption. And you can see that there's two elevation highs um, on um, being expressed at the surface. And the dike is basically located at this low point in between the two. So either side of the dike, um, as it's growing and approaching the surface, the, the ground is being deformed and has these two elevation highs. And you can see in those um, photos above that dike is slightly inclined. And that's why in our uh, transect here, we've got an asymmetry. So one side is being pushed up more than the other. Um, so next, I want to talk to you about other experiments that we do. Um, these ones are on the fourth floor in our new um, Medusa uh, laser imaging facility. Um, so this is our experiment set up um, with the laser in our, our jelly tank, this time being illuminated by a very uh, intense laser light. Um, we've called this um, Medusa. And so I'm the child of the 80s and so often watched things like um, Clash of the Titans. If you've not seen it, I would recommend it. Um, and um, so we called it Medusa basically because if you look into uh, Medusa, you turn to stone. Not quite the case um, upstairs on the fourth floor, but you would go blind. So you have to wear um, these uh, very... Um, uh, special glasses. Um, and so this is Caitlin in the back, also known as Perseus, wearing the special glasses, um, slaying um, the Gorgon, who has these kind of tentacle things like sticking out of the back. So, so that's Medusa. Um, and um, with Medusa, what we're able to do is see inside um, our jelly experiments and actually look in more detail and quantify the fluid uh, dynamics and also um, solid um, strain patterns, things like that. Mostly talking about fluid dynamics today, though. So in these um, analog experiments, um, it's basically exactly the same as the ones I showed um, before. But this time, um, we in, when we um, inject our fluid into the base of the tank, it has these um, passive tracer particles um, seeded into it. So these are um, passive, so they're not partaking in the experiment at all. They're just tracing the motion of the fluid as it's injected into the gel. Um, and um, We've used um, with Caitlin in our the past year, we've been doing experiments using three different uh, fluids, um, which have different viscosities, but they're all Newtonian fluids. They all have a constant viscosity. And the fl three fluids are silicon oil, uh, glycerin uh, solution, so sugary water, and then uh, water itself. So this is um, one of our experiments. This one was published a few years ago. Are you going to work? <laughs> Come on, is it working? Here we go. Oh, it's a bit glitchy on here, um, but hopefully you can see even with this that um, there are particles um, going in, being, creating the dike, they're recirculating, and then that's the point where we see um, the eruption happening at the surface. And from this, um, we can then um, do a technique called um, particle image velocimetry, which is basically a pattern matching um, algorithm, which compares the position and the patterns um, of particles between two different time steps um, to then map out a velocity field inside our analog dike. And um, this is um, a simulation of the result. I'm gonna work. Okay, now it's working. So um, here, the intensity of the colors, so the bright, uh, bright red means fast and white or uh, no color means basically not moving at all and blue is slow. So I'll try and show it again, <laughs> come on. Okay, so, and then the black arrows are basically showing the direction of flow. Um, so you can see this really fast central jet that jet starts to then meander and wiggle as it comes towards the surface. 
But actually, uh, a lot of the pattern you see there is a recirculation as fluid is injected up along the jet and then moves down the side of the dike as the whole of the dike grows. So this was um, some experiments we did a couple of years ago just with water. And so um, with Caitlin, what we wanted to do was expand um, those experiments to look at other fluids and see what kind of patterns that we would get there. And so this is a, a silicon oil experiment. Hopefully it works. Okay. Yep. So, so remember that the silicon oil is the same as water in many respects, um, but it's just more viscous. And hopefully you can see, um, even just with this um, uh, video just there, that there are very similar patterns um, showing there with the silicon oil, even though it's much more viscous than water. And um, this is an ex another experiment with silicon oil. This is the PIV. So this is the fluid pattern. And again, you can see basically the same structure um, is developing. We've got that central fast flowing jet, and then you've got this sort of recirculation of the fluid around as the, as the dike grows. And so in the experiments, what we can do is we can look at those structures, look at how they grow, um, look what influences them. Um, and it's been really interesting to see uh, how with our new laser, um, we can really expand um, the frame rates and um, what the, um, the, the resolution of the structures actually. And so Caitlin's working on that at the moment. Um, but to try and quantify things even further and try and relate it back to the natural system, we need to go to the dimensionless space again. So this is, um, we use the Reynolds number. So Reynolds number, if you're not familiar, is basically um, a calculation which is uh, gives you the ratio of those um, forces which are driving um, the flow and then those that are resisting. So on the top of the equation, we've got the fluid density, basically the buoyancy, then the, the dike thickness, so how, how thick the dike actually is, and then the velocity of motion within the dike as it grows. And the resistive force is then viscosity of the fluid, which is, is on the bottom of the equation. And for um, a high Reynolds number, um, this would be turbulent flow, so a lot of chaotic like motion, and low Reynolds number is, is a laminar flow, so sort of straight streamlines. And so we calculated uh, the Reynolds numbers um, for our um, new experiments with uh, different fluids. Um, and um, with these experiments and our new setup, um, we've been able to um, go actually over about five orders of magnitude of Reynolds number. And um, what's quite interesting is from a, a um, sort of volcanology um, monitoring perspective is that often um, a Reynolds number might be estimated for a dike and how it moves in nature. And so we can, with our experiments, we can now match that. Um, but if you were to use um, the velocity of just the dike tip and how that moves, rather than the velocity of how the fluid moves within, you'd get a, quite a different answer. It'd actually be an order of magnitude different. So we're wondering if this means that Reynolds numbers are probably underestimated in um, the natural um, systems. So, um, and then with our, so the unexpected journey in the lab is actually that these flow patterns um, that we saw just in the water dike, we've actually been able, they, they, are, they exist over many orders of magnitude or Reynolds number. So there's some kind of like fundamental flow process going on inside these Newtonian fluid dikes. Um, and uh, we've got to over a thousand with the Reynolds number um, uh, so far in our experiments. And uh, we've gotten very, very low as well. And we see the same kind of patterns. Um, interestingly, at the very high Reynolds number, when we ran the experiments, it took about 10 seconds um, rather than about 10 or 20 minutes. Um, and just by eye, it looked chaotic. However, if you look, um, if you take your images at very high speed, you actually resolve the same structure. It's just that our eyes were not able to see it. Um, so, um, so that's been very interesting to see how um, uniform that uh, flow pattern actually is in these Newtonian fluid dikes. Um, and so we've got this kind of 
structure happening inside um, dikes as they grow with the jet recirculation, um, jet instability, um, and um, and that that you know is over several orders of magnitude um, a common kind of structure, uh, fluid structure inside them. So and. But we see a bit of jet instability developing. So we're wondering if maybe that is some kind of transition to a turbulent like behavior. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is that um, the assumption that magma is a Newtonian fluid, a very simple um, rheology, probably doesn't really apply in many situations. So our next question was like, hey, what, what if we've got more complex magma uh, rheologies? So more complex fluid flow. And that's because magma is a, a multi-phase um, fluid. It has crystals in it, it has bubbles in it, and the proportions of crystals and bubbles change as the magma ascends. Um, it depends on pressure, temperature, composition. And um, so this Newtonian rheology probably isn't um, going to be very applicable to especially the shallow environment, which is the part which is where we get the signals um, from the surface. Um, and the non-Newtonian uh, rheology is expressed partly just by the crystals that are in there. So this is a, a graph which shows the crystal fraction and then the relative viscosity for different uh, shapes of particle and different uh, proportions as well. So you can see that um, in all cases, the viscosity increases, the more crystals there are in the magma. Um, but then um, if you've got more acicular crystals, then um, the, their effect on the viscosity is, is larger. Um, and it's sort of a non-linear uh, shape on this graph. And this is because these um, acicular crystals, they interact with each other more. And so they disrupt the flow and make it give it a, a higher apparent viscosity. So that's just crystals, but then obviously bubbles um, uh, are important in magma. If you decrease the pressure, gases dissolve. Um, but interestingly, bubbles behave differently depending on what the strain rate is in the magma. And that's expressed by this thing called the capillary number. So um, bubbles at low capillary numbers um, they're dominated by surface tension, and so they remain as um, spheres. And so they really um, disrupt the flow, and they're almost acting like solids in that respect. Whereas um, at high capillary numbers, this means that the bubbles are deformed, they're stretched out. And so they actually have less effect on the uh, um, the bulk viscosity of, of the mixture. So bubbles are more complicated, um, and and again have this non Newtonian, uh, non linear effect on the um, on the the viscosity of the magma. Um, so uh, trying to sort of bring that together, I guess, so this is just a graph showing different kind of um, fluid behaviors that you can get straight lines on this graph on Newtonian um, fluids of um, shear stress against strain rate. You've got low viscosity fluids, high viscosity Newtonian fluids, but the um, magma is more um, represented by a shear thinning um, rheology, so where the, the magma becomes um, less viscous at higher strain rates, becomes, um, becomes thinner, or Herschel Bulkley as well, which has um, a yield stress that needs to be overcome in order to be able to flow. So these more complex uh, magma rheologies are, are really important in volcanic systems. So we did some experiments to explore that. Um, and so people have looked at more complex magma rheologies by actually um, by in analog experiments by actually putting crystals and putting bubbles into the magma analog and then using that. However, that is really complicated. The scaling of it is difficult. Um, and um, so we were really interested a couple of years ago to learn about um, single phase fluids um, 
single phase polymers so dissolved in water and you have a non-newtonian rheology like this we've got viscosity against strain rate here and this non-newtonian um, rheology shape to the curve um, but it's a single phase fluid so it's it's just one um one fluid it doesn't have crystals in it, doesn't have bubbles in it, and yet it represents a multi a multi phase fluid. And so, with an experiment, that's a lot easier to work with. And so, that's what we've been doing the past uh, couple of years. And the two fluids that we're using that are shear thinning are called xanthan gum and um, hydryl oxycellulose polymer solution, or HEC, also called natrosol. Um, and so it's exactly the same as our water, silicon, glycerin, like experiments, but this time we're using these shear thinning fluid instead, and the passive tracer particles are seeded in there. So this is an experiment of an HEC dike. Let's see if you're going to work. Can you kind of work? There we go. And so um, hopefully you can see, yeah. Um, just by eye, without having to do any algorithms, the flow patterns are really very different. Um, just uh, occasionally you get little clumps of um, uh, particles, and those are actually really useful here because they help to uh, show the stream, um, the, the flow patterns more nicely. Um, but you can even just tell here um, this is a much wider fissure that's erupts, that's been created at the surface. We don't seem to see the the jet. Um, in the dike. And so this is the PIV. Um, and again, the color um, represents red is very fast, blue or white is like um, very slow or not moving at all. And from here, you can see it's really uniform, actually. There isn't much variation in um, velocity across the whole dike. So it's a very different flow pattern for the cellar size dike. And that's, this is at two different time steps. And then we did it for xanthan gum as well, and we basically got the same kind of pattern. Um, but um, so it was like, OK, we have injected these shear thinning fluids and um, we've got really different patterns in our experiments. But then the question is, OK, did these fluids actually behave as shear thinning fluids in our experiment? So this was another unexpected journey in the lab um, because we planned for them to be shear thinning fluids. They should be shear thinning fluids. And yet when you do your strain rate calculations, uh, we're really low down here on the strain rates. So when we saw these results, we were like, OK, so actually, um, even though we have these fluids with the, um, which should have a, quite a wide range in viscosities being expressed depending on the strain rate, something is happening inside the dikes which makes them, which cuts down the velocities, cuts down the strain rates, which means that we're only getting very low uh, strain rates actually happening in the lab. So maybe these fluids are not even behaving as shear thinning fluids. Um, and so that was unexpected, um, but it led us down this um, uh, route of doing more experiments to explore the Reynolds number effect, because if it's not a shear thinning fluid, clearly there's something different going on here. So maybe it was a Reynolds number effect. Um, but as uh, Caitlin's done in, and shown in her work, um, over a five orders of magnitude of Reynolds number with the Newtonian fluid, we saw that recirculation pattern. And with these experiments, we can have the same Reynolds number um, as in the Newtonian fluid dikes, and we get this very different pattern. So even though there's just a small amount of shear thinning behavior being actually expressed in the experiments, it has a really dramatic effect on the flow patterns um, inside these growing dikes. So that's been um, quite a surprise. So in our Newtonian fluid dikes, um, waters, silicon oil, glycerin, things like that, we have the jet, we have the recirculation. Um, whereas in the shear thinning fluids, it's completely different pattern. It's a, a more uniform um, velocity across the whole dike and all the, all the vectors are going up and outwards as the, um, the dike grows. 
So very drastically different flow regimes. And because we've done the work on the Reynolds number, the only thing that's, that, that we think that it can be is the shear thinning rheology. And even a small amount of crystals and bubbles can therefore significantly affect the flow pattern inside. So we've been trying to piece this all together, think about what's going on as magmas ascend through the crust. Um, at the moment, we're, what we're thinking is that we can maybe put these somehow onto this diagram of um, apparent viscosity against strain weight, where you've got your non-Newtonian um, fluid here of low viscosities at high strain rates, high viscosities at low strain rates, um, these flat parts of the curve, and then the shear thinning behavior is the transition between these two uh, viscosities. So at really, really high strain rates, it's basically behaving like a Newtonian fluid because um, as you strain, change the strain rate, the viscosity doesn't change. So I'm wondering if maybe this pattern is actually, could be created in those kind of circumstances. However, then when you slow down and the viscosity increases or the crystal content increases, all these things, then we would transition to quite a different flow pattern, which is more uh, uniform velocity across the dike, more just upward pointing. And then maybe in the very late stages of like um, things hardly moving at all, possibly then we could get back to this jet-like behavior. Um, but it's quite speculative still, it's quite speculative still. And um, this is, we're trying to just piece this all together. Um, and so I guess that takes me back to nature and the complexity of natural systems and how we can relate our analog experiments um, back to um, the uh, magma and how it's moving around um, today. And ideally what we want is a method or a measurement that could that was basically the same in our analog experiments as it is in nature. Um, and so for magma moving around now, it's the, I think the, the closest connection that we'll have is through the ground deformation signals. So the surface displacement, maybe something with the um, uh, seismicity that would be created around our analog dikes. Um, so that's something that we're working on um, in the very near future. Um, but then most of the work that we've been doing in the past couple of years has been trying to link to the signals that are recorded in the geological record. Um, and that's been through um, magnetic fabrics um, within um, crystalline magma and crystal alignment or crystal distortions as well. Um, so linking then back to the the field it's like how would magma flow be actually expressed in nature and there are a few different ways in which that could could happen um, and that's done through geometries distributions preferred orientations of crystals clasps bubbles all these kind of things and so um there's some fantastic exposures out there showing evidence of how magma has moved in the past, but the problem is that they're pretty rare. And so you end up using microscopic techniques or magnetic um, uh, techniques to look at the microcrystalline fabrics. And these kinematic indicators are giving us Im information about um, the sense of shear that happened during the magma as it flowed. Um, and so Simon Martin he completed his PhD a couple of years ago. He went to the Isle of Skye and looked at how magma flow is recorded in dikes and sills. And he was able to unravel um, uh, fabrics which were related to the crack first being created and the magma flowing in using AMS, an isotropy of magnetic susceptibility. And then uh, also fluid motion related to magma solidification processes. And that was using a mostly AARM. And Simon's got a couple of papers about that, um, which I'll direct you to. Um, and then um, linking back to analog experiments, Simon did some interesting experiments in Prague um, where we used um, plaster seeded with magnetite crystals and injected it into a box of, of flour um, to create um, 
an analog uh, volcanic plumbing system that was solidified and then had magnetic particles in it. In it. And so from that, we were actually then able to drill our analog plumbing system and look at the fabrics. Um, and it's really promising actually as a technique to directly link the field observations um, with an, a solidified analog model. And then um, Stefano Albani is working in Iceland at the moment. He's not there right now, um, but he's done quite a lot of work um, in uh, eastern Iceland, sampling dikes, looking in really high um, resolution at how magnetic fabrics are recorded along the margin of a, of a, of a dike. And this was a really nice dike. Um, to sample because it's exposed continuously for a kilometer and then over about 300 meters of elevation change as well and he's got many many samples all along the edge of that and um, so hopefully we can see what the flow fabrics are like um, in high resolution there now linking just back again to the lab and this is Kate Williams's PhD work um, she's created sills, um, so dike fed sills in analog experiments in jelly. And um, in her paper, she used a shear thinning fluid and showed flow localization actually happening inside the sill um, as it was formed. So a horizontal magma sheet, but the shape of the, the sill was really affecting um, the, uh, the flow behavior. And so she's been trying to test this in the field. She's gone to look at the wind sill um, across Northern England. And she's um, looked for um, crystal fabrics and crystal distortions or any kind of evidence of magma flow in the wind sill. And um, at the moment, she hasn't found any evidence of magma flow, really. She's a few places where there is field observations that, like stretch bubbles or crenulations. But in the microcrystalline material, there's uh, no evidence really of flow. So that's been really interesting because why not? <laughs> And um, it comes back, I think, to this result that we've got now, um, which is about flow regimes and how they might be recorded. So in order to have these sort of kinematic indicators, um, you need something there to first show it. So you need a crystal or something um, to, to measure. Um, and, um, and, and that therefore means that if you do have um, something like that, then maybe you're more likely to be in a shear thinning um, magma um, behavior. Um, you also need um, uh, flow velocity gradients. So you need not just a uniform velocity. So if you don't have that, then you also don't have a mechanism to create a flow fabric. Um, so I, was, I just saw this yesterday, actually, this nice new paper by um, Copping et al. Um, showing about how fabrics would be developed um, during magma intrusion. But I, I really wonder about how these things are going to be preserved when we've got these different kind of flow regimes happening. And ultimately, I think we need 3D mapping of flow during growth to actually get to the bottom of this. So Caitlin's working on that in the very near future in our, our new uh, laser lab. <laughs> Um, so in summary, I think um, uh, we've got two um, different models of dike flow. Uh, one is this sort of jet flow model, which is crystal pore, bubble pore, showing recirculation. Then the creeping flow, which is more uniform velocity. But the dikes can possibly transition between these two different flow behaviors. And even a small amount of uh, shear thinning behavior could really have quite dramatic effects on which regime the dike is in. Um, and so this is going to be, I think, really important for the way that we interpret the signals of magma movement, um, the way that crystals have moved around inside a dike as it grows um, can have very significant impacts. We need to think about magma rheology, host rock deformation, how these things are coupled. Um, and moving on to 3D visualization is actually going to be really important um, to hopefully then link the, the lab observations with um, the field and natural systems. And that's all I have for you.
<laughs> yes, we have a lot of jelly. <laughs> yeah, so um, for those on Zoom or um, on, on online, the question is like, how does the scaling work in terms of dimensions? So um, we've got um, in the lab, our, our dikes are about 20 centimeters wide. Um, so that corresponds in nature to a dike, which is a few hundreds of meters wide. So, um, and I mean um, the uh, lateral extent. So the thickness uh, is a couple of millimeters in our tank. And so that would probably scale up to something about a meter or to, um, one to 10 meters wide, which is actually how thick they tend to be in nature. So we've got quite good information on the geometry that at least things, things, the aspect ratio is quite representative, but it's a good question. Scaling is important. Otherwise it's just jelly in a tank. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, so um, for the virtual audience, the question is about natural heterogeneities in rocks and how those might be represented in an analog experiment or how when you've got such a simple experiment, how you could then link it to a more complex system. And I think the, the answer to that is that um, you do it step by step. So we can in introduce heterogeneities into the experiment. So one example would be the layered experiments um, where we've created sills. And with each gelatin layer, you can control its stiffness. And so you can create a layered crust of different rock types, let's say, and then consider, explore how magma moves through that and how it interacts with those different uh, materials. You can also cut the jelly and uh, create cracks and faults and see how it would interact with that, with that for example. So, um, so I think that in nature, the problem, with, well, the, the challenge is that it's very complicated. There's lots of things that have gone on. And I think that's why uh, in an analog experiment, it's important to simplify things because actually even in a very, very simple scenario, it's still quite complicated. And by then exploring different parameters, we can hopefully understand which is more important to control the overall dynamics or to help us answer the particular question that we're exploring. Why is your well? You're in. Um, so the question is about um, why doesn't a shear thinning fluid low fl have flow localization and therefore like run away into being this like jet-like feature? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, my intuition was the same as as yours, Andy. So therefore, I was very surprised when. So um, I wasn't, we weren't able to get that kind of structure in the lab. There was a, a red herring thrown in um, a couple of years ago, which was an experiment that we conducted where we did use a shear thinning fluid. And then we did get flow localization and breakouts and things like that. And I was like, oh, well, clearly, clearly this is what shear thinning fluids do. Um, and then um, over, yeah, four or five years, never managed to reproduce it ever again. So I've got one experiment like that. And then looking back in the notes, I realized that that experiment had been done on a really hot summer day. And if anybody's been up on the fourth floor in the summer, it's very hot up there. So our jelly was very soft. And, um, and in all experiments we did since, the jelly was cold and elastic. Um, so I think 
the complex uh, coupling between the fluid flow and the solid and how it deforms is, is really important. Um, but then the shape of the dike as well is important too. So the strain rate is the thing in the shear thinning fluid, which uh, which shows or is then expressed by this lower viscosity. So higher strain rates mean that it's it flow it's a lower viscosity. Let's say the highest strain rates are actually in the tip region because that's where the dike is thinnest. So that's actually where the the low viscosity material is, and that is probably we think that we're still thinking about it, but we think that that actually helps to to grow the dike. Um, whereas in the Newtonian fluid sense uh, experiments, the fluid's coming in faster than the crack can grow. And so it just has to go round and round, circulate around, which apparently is not a surprising thing for engineers to have seen. Because I remember when we did these experiments the first time, I was like, <gasps> and my engineering colleague was like, well, yeah, obviously it does that. And I was like, well, geologists don't think it does that. So, um, so that was an interesting conversation. But yeah, so it's interesting how sometimes our tuition is like actually somehow mismatched, but then you see a, a result which matches your intuition. Like, oh, that must be right. But then over many years of trying to do other experiments, the evidence just isn't there. And it, so that's why unexpected journeys are what was quite a good title because I've been confused for a long time and still a bit confused, obviously, but you know, trying to figure it out bit by bit. And I think we're, we're starting to get there, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so the question I think is about uh, magma solidification processes and how temperatures of uh, changes of, would affect um linking the experiments back to nature. So it's um it's right that in our experiments we don't consider temperature. Um, there have been experiments done in the past which have injected a fluid which solidifies as it uh, is being injected. And they show some interesting structures like lobe-like morphologies and breakouts and things like that, which is quite nice. The problem with those experiments, though, is that they actually kind of end up melting their host material um, as, they, as it's being intruded and then it kind of solidifies. So it's actually quite complicated to say exactly what's going on. But... Um, in the natural system, it's the quenched chill uh, margins of the intrusion that we're probably most interested in sampling because that has captured the first magma that's gone through into the cold rock and then um, has preserved those fabrics, most likely to have preserved those fabrics. The problem with that material is it's the most fragile as well. So you've got, kind of, yeah, it's, it's challenging, but um, uh, evolving viscosity through solidification is definitely something that's interesting and I think maybe in the shear thinning fluids we kind of capture that a little bit in that the lower strain rate thing is actually more viscous so it's like it's sort of, sort of partially solidifying but I guess in our experiments and it could well be true in nature in some cases as well if you then suddenly increase the strain rate or so increase the velocities you can like remobilize this stuff and then uh, maybe erode it out and things and I think there is good evidence that that does happen sometimes in the natural system as well you can think of it a little bit like a turbidity current type thing where you've got deposition which would be like solidification and then erosion when you've got a big new flux of material coming through I think the same idea can somehow be applied to solidification of magma inside a sheet like body okay right, right cheers thank you <laughs> Thank you.